Welcome to the morning edition, the Monday morning edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 326. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm Gavin Ashenden, and it's the 25th of September, 2017. Okay, welcome to another program. Right after we recorded last week, I saw a uh, plea from Gavin to pray for his eye because uh, he had injured it in some way and he uh, went to the eye doctor and uh, they said, ah, you're getting old. And uh, <laughs> Gavin yeah, uh, needed our prayer. Uh, let's do a quick update. What what happened to your eye, Gavin? <clears throat> well, Kevin, I've... <laughs> I think it's a combination of stupidity and bad luck. Uh, the, the stupidity of it was I'm, I'm on warfarin. I've had a, a strange heart for 20 years. It's got atrial fibrillation. Lots of people have got it. Uh, and to avoid you getting a blood clot, they thin your blood with warfarin, and that's good. And um, uh, I, I think I overdosed. I took the wrong pill and took twice as much as I should have done and then went for a long walk in the hills. The hills around us are... are, are they're not mountains, but they're very bleak uh, and uh, they're even quite dangerous. And th- uh, there was a rainstorm coming and I looked at my applications and thought I have plenty of time, but the rain came quicker than it should have done. And I was slower than I thought I was. And I was without a coat. Uh, and I got caught in a pretty severe rainstorm, which turned out to be very cold rain and a very cold wind. And um, I think that probably put strain on my system as I'm no longer 25. And the combination of having having poisoned myself with warfarin and got caught, I think elevated my blood pressure and, and having stumbled down some fairly steep crags, um, the eye hemorrhaged. Uh, so I don't have much sight in it, but I'm told that um, there's, a, there's a chance it'll get better in time as the, as the body reabsorbs the, the, the effusion of blood. So thank you for those who've been praying for me. I'm very grateful. Oh, Gavin, we will keep you in our prayers. Uh, keep all the people at England Scripted who are over 40 at, in your prayers. because uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. We need a hedge of protection. Obviously, we're, we're, we're doing things that involve uh, spiritual warfare as well, and uh, uh, we, we, do, we do need that protection. Uh, boy, there's t- just so much news from uh, the Church of England this, these days. Uh, uh, people remember the early days of Anglican Unscripted. We've had Peter Old on like once every two months because things over there were just kind of slow. There just seems to be more of a quickening in the process of news coming out of the Church of England and some of the crazy things you English do. Um, I'm speaking specifically now of a fashion show. And when it comes to the world of fashion, you, people think of the, the Devil Wears Prada. Uh, they think of, uh, you know, how hedonistic and narcissistic the, the fashion industry really is, how they promote the worst among them sometimes, and how you go to a clothes rack at a, a, at a um, Calvin Klein or other place and you just go, how did this ever get here? Well, somebody thought it was cool. Somebody thought it'd be cool to have a fashion show in a church in England, Gavin. What happened? Kevin, this, this really, you couldn't make it up. I know. This is the, if, if, you wrote, if you wrote this in a novel, people would accuse you of being very, very clumsy. Um, first of all, as a fashion event, it really outdid itself. Uh, the, the, the fashion producer decided to uh, do as much as she could in terms of Satanism and Freemasonry. So she combined them together in a kind of really very naive um, but completely overblown fashion show where she had Satanic and Masonic images uh, covering all her models on a catwalk in front of a Christian altar. So this in itself is is horrible and actually uh, you know, anyone, um, I think any Christian with the Holy Spirit very quickly gets a sensitivity to the power of certain symbols, both the power of Christian symbols and the power of occult symbols. And when you look at this in the, the pictures in a newspaper, something revolts you and disturbs you very deep inside. So how did it happen that a church in London 
uh, was willing to host a satanic fashion show? <laughs> and the answer was they made a mistake. Well, that, that's the easy bit. The Diocese of London put out a, uh, a brief, and I'm sure they're telling the truth, saying we just didn't ask the right questions. We've always been in favour of fashion. I mean, that itself is a slightly odd thing. Why on earth the Diocese of London would see itself in favour of fashion, given how completely ephemeral, shallow and egotistic it is? That, that in itself is a question. But putting that to one side, um, partly, I think, perhaps from a kind of propensity to like the arts in a rather... Um, uh, in a rather uh, fashionable way. They uh, have lots of fashion shows and they didn't ask the right questions. What struck me about this was what Carl Gustav Jung, uh, who is a, is, a, is a dangerous spiritual authority, but nonetheless, he described some interesting things and he described something called synchronicity. When things come together for a reason that doesn't make much rational sense. And I, I asked where this church was and it's St. Andrew's Hoban. Now, St. Andrew's Hoban happens to be the church that is looked after by one of the bishops in Forward in Faith in the Church of England, a very, very nice man. Uh, and the bishops in the society are of a high calibre. But this particular bishop was a Freemason and quite a senior Freemason before he was consecrated. Um, Rowan Williams doesn't often get the press he ought to get sometimes on Anglican Unscripted. So I think Rowan deserves the credit for saying to Jonathan Baker, if you want to be a bishop in the Church of England, you must resign from all things Masonic. Absolutely. Now, nobody knows whether having resigned uh, privately, he's taken it up again, but he was a senior Mason. And in my experience of the deliverance ministry and spiritual direction, uh, when you've immersed yourself in something quite as distorted as Freemasonry spiritually. Uh, it's not enough to give it up. Um, there has to be some deeper repentance and, and setting free. Now, I have no idea about this man's personal life and nor is it my business, but it is extraordinary that of all the churches in London, and there are thousands of them, uh, the one which had a Masonic vicar and bishop presiding over it should be the one where the, the mistake in inverted commas happened to be made and evil in its full panoply of dressing up strutted itself in front of the crucifix and the altar as, as, as an abomination. So I think if there's a, is there a spiritual message, there's clearly a practical message. A practical message is to the Church of England, read the small print <laughs> when people come to you. But is there a, is there a spiritual message? Because this, is, this, is, this seems to me to be offering uh, us a spiritual message that, that is written in neon lights, and that is that you're involved in a very serious spiritual struggle. And if for any reason at all you let your guard down, the guard that Christ gives you by virtue of baptism and repentance and the sacraments, evil will come flooding in. And there it is on the front pages of all the newspapers, flooding into a Christian church, which has somehow given up its defences. And this ought to be a warning for the whole of the Church of England, to all Christians, but particularly to the Church of England. It, it is beyond, we've talked about this before, beyond reason. Uh, the Church of England just can't catch a break. Uh, at times it's its own worst enemies, sometimes by design, sometimes by just, you know, the, the people who are in charge, who don't know what they're doing, uh, and mm -hmm. sometimes by accident uh, or oversight, uh, whether this be the case or not. Um, but like you said yesterday, all over the papers in England, uh, the pictures from the satanic uh, fashion show uh, in a Church of England church. Um, ugh. You wrote an interesting article for Anglican Inc., and we want to thank you for that, uh, that described uh, the crisis at the top uh, with the Archbishop of Canterbury. And uh, it, it dealt a little bit with the uh, issue of the cross-dressing six-year-old uh, who's uh, attending the school, and there's trouble, you know, obviously with the parents. And uh, this is more uh, news in England than you get here in America. Um, and I read your article and I said, you know, in church this month, you know, in the last couple of weeks, we've been, we've been reading Romans. And Romans is about making sure that we don't go crazy over the small things and that we keep the big things the big things. As my, my uh, priest will say, uh, keeping the majors the majors and the minors the minors. And, you know, these issues, 
looked at from a secular uh, point of view are, are minor. What's the big deal with cross-dressing? What's the big deal with transgenderism? What's the big deal with you know sexual identity? And it, it, it's not a big deal. In the Christian world, we often say, well, if they don't think it's a big deal, it's probably not a big deal. And that's the fault. That's the failing is we look to the secular world for how we should feel about something. In the terms of scripture, we have um, the heart and mind uh, of our father uh, who identifies what is a big deal and what's not really a big deal. Um, <clears throat> walking through the wheat on Sabbath, not a big deal. That's not a big one. Uh, abominations are a big deal. And uh, Gavin, you kind of addressed this in this article. Um, why would transgenderism be a big deal? This is really quite an important question for all of us, Kevin. And um, if we don't understand this, then I think we uh, will find ourselves even more vulnerable to the uh, cultural changes that are coming against the church. At one level, it's unimaginable that transgenderism should become um, the test for being a citizen. Uh, transgender toilets, why? Cross-dressing, who cares? Most of us are not really <laughs> that interested in the, in the private imaginations of our, our neighbours. But in this particular case, um, if, if one thinks a little more carefully about the issues, what we're dealing with is, is, a, is a campaign of some kind. And the campaign, which we'll call cultural Marxism for the moment, it, it began with, a, with, with, first of all, with feminism. Uh, and each of these campaigns has something virtuous and, and some poison in it. The virtue in feminism is it appears to be about being fair. Um, and who could not be fair? But the, but the poison in feminism is uh, setting men and women against each other and redefining ourselves in power relations. The beautiful thing about Christianity is that it heals the relationships between men and women by immersing us in the vulnerability and humility of love. Now, that's um, an important point, because with feminism, the measure is always the man. They always want to compare themselves to the male. And we learn from our creation, our measure is in Christ. And it is. And, but, but also, as, as well as that, mm -hmm. it's two different, two different Absolutely. environments. Yeah. One is power and one is love. Mm -hmm. and, and Christianity uh, is at work to subvert power. So when the relationships between men and women, which um, are always uh, a struggle, um, are set in terms of power, we have trouble. When Christianity redeems them by injecting love and humility and an inverted hierarchy. But that was feminism. And then along came gay marriage. Uh, and again, this applies, instead of applying to 50% of the population, this applies to 1.8% of the population. Why should we be terribly upset about that? And the answer appears to be, that the hidden theological or spiritual struggle is about dissolving the relationship between men, women and their children. In other words, making, making other things and other relationships normative. Um, God gives us his norms and his paradigms in scripture and he wants Christians to, um, to, to help set up this fabric for other human beings as a way of human flourishing. So again, the whole gay marriage thing is not just about gay people not getting their rights. It's about setting up a wholly different pattern for men, women, and their relationship with their children. So the gay, the, 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 the trans issue, what on earth is this? Well, this is 1.05% of the population. So it's not a demographic issue. Um, what's really going on? Men and women already uh, dress up in each other's clothes. So some of this, Scotsmen wear kilts, women wear jeans. You know, the, these... Uh, if we if we look at these things, what they are, they're not a big deal. They become a big deal when the when the human imagination begins to be distorted. And so, when you take who you are, uh, a man or a woman, made up of uh, XX and XY, uh, or and, and genitals and hormones, and when you say, "I'm not putting up with this. I'm going to change this because my imagination or my feelings require something different. I, I won't accept." the way in which I was born uh, and work on that to remedy or heal it. What you end up with is a, uh, is a world of, of narcissism and, and to some extent idolatry. 
everything focusing on on the self and determined to change it, if you like, again, by force. So the problem with cross-dressing and transsexualism is that uh, it is at some, to some extent a challenge to what God has given, and particularly a challenge to the paradigm of men and women who act as, excuse me, my, my, my earpiece keeps on falling out. Uh, let's stick it in a bit harder. <laughs> right. um, you got big so, ears. Uh, you know, who knew? So, <laughs> uh, so, so in actual fact, it's not just, uh, there are a number of ways you could deal with this. You could first of all ask, what are parents doing allowing a six-year-old child to decide its gender identity? Even assuming you can decide your gender identity in your head, which you can't. It's a mental uh, uh, dis-ease. What are parents doing allowing a child to do that? And then if the parents decide that they want the child to live like this, what are they doing in imposing it on the rest of society? And what has our society done in passing laws that say the irresponsible parents of a disturbed child have the right to impose their irresponsibility and their domestic disturbance on all the other children in the class? Uh, you know, that's what the Equalities Act allows you to do uh, so another question is, why does a church school choose to read a narrow interpretation of the Equalities Act? I have no doubt at all that if the headmaster said, well, actually, this doesn't come under the Act, uh, in our opinion, go home and put the right clothes on, that would have been the end of it. So why is a church school following the worst interpretation of the Act? And then when the Christian parents come to the church school and say, excuse me, uh, we don't think you're batting on the right side, why does the church school tell them to get lost so in the end, they have to go to the law to ask for uh, a legal opinion on whether the church school read, read it properly. And then when they come, well, then what is the bishop doing about this in the diocese? Nothing. When the Archbishop of Canterbury, who is responsible for the, for the ethics and the witness of, of the whole church in the country, asked on one of our most prominent radio stations what he thinks of it, for him to put his head in his hands and say he finds it difficult, and then to suggest that the only answer is for the Christian, the parents of the Christian child to tell their child have a bit more respect for the conscience and convictions of the trans-dressing six-year-old. Well, to my mind, it's, a, it's a, as much an abrogation of archiepiscopal responsibility as the original parents uh, of the cross-dressing child who sent their child to school. I, I'm just I'm just astonished at it, really. And I think, really, the Church of England and the Archbishop could do better. <sighs> Again, no, uh, we find ourselves in these situations where, um, as I said before, we look to the secular uh, culture as the you know giving us guidance. How should we feel about transgenderism? How should we feel about cross testing? And we end up in these sticky situations. Uh, I have pity on uh, Archbishop Justin Welby who has taken um, apologetics as apologizing for the church and not yes. a defense of Christ and uh, you know he's in over his head we got that um, maybe he could appoint some good theologians to help out with press um, it ju it's just not working Gavin well, that sums it up, Kevin. The, 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 and the difficulty is that, that the fear is that, um, that, that the Church of England, which is under a great deal of stress uh, as it struggles with secular culture, is coming apart at the seams. Um, those of us who are traditionalists would say to it, look, if you'd only followed the scriptures, if you'd, if you'd followed the maker's manual, if you'd been obedient, uh, if you'd repented where you'd gone wrong, then you would have a greater defense against these things. But by giving way to culture, uh, by not being obedient, by, by not having discernment, by having managers who don't seem to understand theology or the Bible, uh, you're going to come apart quicker and more drastically than you would anyway, given the fact that we're in a very serious struggle with a, with a secular culture that doesn't like Christianity and doesn't like the church. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm Gavin Nashon, and you've been listening to episode 326 of Anglican Unscripted. God bless you. Make sure you take the right pills. Yes.